everyone. Welcome to the Natasha Crane podcast. Is there a new reformation happening in the church? Well, that depends on who you ask. The new apostolic reformation, sometimes known as NAR, is a popular and fast growing new movement of Christians who emphasize signs and wonders and teach that God is giving new revelation through new apostles and prophets today. Some churches associated with those teachings have even become household names. For example, you've probably heard of the widely influential Bethel Church. But are NAR teachings consistent with the historic Christian faith? That is the question that my guest today, Holly Pivick, seeks to answer in her new book, Counterfeit Kingdom, which she co-authored with Biola professor Douglas Guyvet. Holly is a blogger and author and speaker, as well as a pastor's wife and a homeschooling mom. She has a master's degree in Christian apologetics from Biola University, and she's co-authored three books about the New Apostolic Reformation. She also writes a popular blog, and you can read that and find out all about her at hollypivic.com, and that is spelled holly, P-I-V-E-C, dot com. Welcome to the show, Holly. Thanks so much, Natasha. Thanks for having me on. Well, I've been really excited about this conversation because there is so much to learn about this movement. It is quite complex. There are a lot of misconceptions and misperceptions out there. And I got an early copy of your book. I actually was one of the endorsers on it. So I had a chance to read it, even though at the time of this recording, it's not out yet. It comes out on November 18th. 15th. Okay. It comes out November 15th, but it's available for pre-order. And I highly recommend this book to everyone. This conversation is to introduce people to some of the topics that you discuss, but there's so much more in the book. And I've just got to say that I learned so much personally from reading it because I had some loose understanding of these things, but this wasn't a subject I'd really gotten into in tons of depth. And you just did a fabulous job with it. So very excited for this conversation. But there are a lot of people listening who have never heard of NAR. Maybe they've never heard of Bethel Church specifically, or maybe they've never heard of either one. So let's just start out with the basics. Let's give people some definitions and context. What is NAR? Who is Bethel Church? And what is the connection between those two subjects? Right. So NAR, or the New Apostolic Reformation, is a very large, fast-growing global movement and it's, it's a movement of churches that are led by individuals who claim to be authoritative apostles and prophets. And these apostles and prophets claim that they're giving critical new revelation that all Christians must have so that every believer can learn to work miracles like raising the dead, healing the sick, prophesying, to work even greater miracles than Jesus worked according to the teachings in this movement, if you can imagine that. And uh, what they'll say, the leaders in this movement say that the Great Commission is actually a commission to bring God's physical kingdom to earth and um, not, not to go just take the gospel of the good news of what Jesus did on the cross, you know, uh, his death on the cross and how that made the way for forgiveness of sins, reconciliation with God, you know, eternal life, all those things possible. That's not, the Great Commission isn't to just go take that gospel into the world, like Christians would, would historically say. But the Great Commission is a commission to um, take dominion of the nations, as in socio-political control. And um, the reason that that Great Commission hasn't been accomplished for the past 2,000 years, according to these leaders in this movement, is because apostles and prophets have been missing. And they're the ones with the new revelation, which they sometimes refer to as strategies, uh, to allow people to de develop the miraculous powers and wage the spiritual warfare that they would say is needed to bring God's kingdom to earth. Um, and it's, it's really important. We always really try to emphasize a couple of things. The teachings of the new apostolic reformation, though they talk about miracles and prophesying and things like that, these are not the teachings of classical Pentecostalism or historic, uh, Charismatic churches, um, these te NAR teachings are extreme. You know, Pentecostals, Charismatics will talk about the miraculous gifts like speaking in tongues, prophesying, working miracles, these things, but they're talking about gifts. In the NAR, they're talking about formal governmental offices that apostles and prophets must hold the highest offices in the church. Even pastors must submit to them and come under their authority. And um, they must govern the church so in order to bring their new revelations. And But the other thing that we really always try to emphasize is they don't always say things that directly. So the leaders in this movement, 
many of them will say outright that pastors must submit to them, that all Christians must submit to them. They'll use that language. But many others will use euphemisms. They'll use softer terms to, um, that they know don't sound as controversial. So they'll say things like all Christians should align with them and these type of things. So that's really imp something we really stress for people to understand is they're not going to hear these leaders necessarily always saying, yeah, all Christians must submit to our authority so we can give them critical new revelation. But, but they will talk about Christians needing to align with them and that they're giving new strategies. And, and so they'll imply that this revelation is critical, even if they don't say that outright. That, that's a really helpful distinction. And, I, and I'm glad that you said that because a lot of times when you bring up the subject of NAR or a specific church that's associated with that, people will jump in and say, you know, well, what's the problem with a mm -hmm. Pentecostal viewpoint? Or, you know, what if you're charismatic? Does that mean that you're not biblical? And so a lot of people conflate the two. So that's a really good distinction uh, off the top of this. And what about Bethel Church specifically? So you talk a lot about Bethel Church um, in particular, but mm -hmm. who is Bethel Church and what is the relationship? Relationship between Bethel Church and NAR. Why do these subjects go so hand in hand that you're kind of tackling them together in this book? Right. So Bethel Church in Redding, California is the most influential NAR church today, really, in the nation and in the world. It's led by the Apostle Bill Johnson, who uh, working together with the prophet, prophet Chris Valentin. And of course, uh, Bethel Music comes out of Bethel Church in Redding, which is really among the most popular music used in churches today, uh, not just in our churches, of course, but uh, Pentecostal churches, charismatic churches, and, and even just non-denominational churches, evangelical churches, um, uh, you know, um, most, most churches, it seems like, are using Bethel music today. And so it's been a, it's been a, a church that's responsible for really popularizing the teachings of the New Apostolic Reformation and spreading them around the world. So sometimes people are familiar with a subject even when they don't realize it. So, for example, I think that there are probably a lot of people who think that they've never heard of NAR, but they actually know some of the leaders' names. They've come across them. Or maybe people don't know about Nath Bethel Church by name, but they are singing those songs on Sunday. So just to give people a little more context here, what are some of the names of some of the best-known NAR leaders? And what are some of the popular songs people might be singing on Sunday that are coming out of Bethel? You don't have to sing them. <laughs> right. oh, well, you can name good. them, but if you'd like to I'm sing, I'm deaf, totally open so. to that too. <laughs> no, I'm pretty sure I'm tone deaf, so I, I will <laughs> think. But um, so, of course, I mentioned Bill Johnson and Chris Belton at, at Bethel Church, and there's a lot of other leaders at Bethel Church who are well known, like Danny Silk and, and others there. Mike Bickle at the International House of Prayer in Kansas City, Missouri, is a major leader in this movement. Even though on the website of the International House of Prayer in Kansas City, they have a statement against the New Apostolic Reformation and deny affiliation. But but what you know I'd say to that is is uh, they still are part of the New Apostolic Reformation because they hold to the key teachings that there are governing apostles and prophets today. Uh, and they're giving new revelation. And so you can deny that, as, as we can talk about later, that many NAR leaders might deny they're part of this movement, but that doesn't mean they are. Um, so Banning Liebscher, Jesus Culture is a church in Sacramento, California. Many people may know, or at least their music. Uh, Randy Clark at Global Awakening is a, is a big name. Um, Cindy Jacobs is a big name. Heidi Baker at Iris Global, she's in Mozambique. Um, and then as far as Bethel Music Songs, that people may know. Uh, no Longer Slaves is a popular song. You Make Me Brave, Raise a Hallelujah, um, Reckless Love, um, Goodness of God. These are all uh, some of their popular songs. They have many, many popular songs. I feel like you can't even say the words reckless love without the song entering your head for the rest of the day. I'm going to have to get that out of my head for the rest of this interview. Uh, these, yeah, these are songs that most churches have, a, a, they've sang the songs at some point or they, or they are familiar with them. A lot of people are singing these songs. And so it, it very much has influenced throughout the churches. And we're going to get to that whole topic of music a little bit later. And you, uh, there's so many things in that that I just want to talk about now. But just to, to get 
continue giving people the context here. Whether someone has heard of Nar or Bethel, it's an important subject for every Christian to know about because of this widespread influence that they have. And according to your book, more than 3.5 million people worldwide attend churches that look to Nar apostles and prophets. And even beyond that, you say that many of Bethel's followers in particular will attend a more traditional church, maybe on Sunday, but then in the week they're going home and they're seeking out Bethel teachings. They're listening to the sermons and, and following leaders of, of other NAR churches. So obviously with growth and popularity like this, there's something that is very compelling to people about NAR teachings. Help us understand what is the draw? What is pulling people into these movements? Yeah, to clarify, so 3.5 million people are part of apostolic networks, according to the Center for the Study of Global Christianity at Gordon Conwell. They provide that, that number for us. And those are networks that are directly governed by an apostle. In addition, though, millions of more people attend churches uh, that are not a part of apostolic networks, um, but they've still been heavily influenced by NAR teachings. They'll invite apostles and prophets in to speak. They'll study their books. They'll look to them as apostles and prophets. So this could be uh, many Pentecostal and charismatic churches, uh, even more and more non-denominational churches. But then beyond that, you have people that are just part of more traditional churches who will go to their traditional Bible teaching church on a Sunday morning, even a conservative Bible teaching church, and then will listen to these leaders during the week. They'll seek out their teaching, you know, online or, or that kind of thing, because they believe that these apostles and prophets have miraculous powers and that they have a direct pipeline to God that other people don't have. Um, they have an apostolic or prophetic anointing. Um, so many people believe that without, say, you know, Bill Johnson or Chris Belton's new revelations, uh, they can't experience intimacy with God. Uh, they can't defeat demonic strongholds in their lives so that might be holding them back. And um, they can't fulfill their divinely appointed destinies. So, so people really f feel that they fear that they'll miss out on blessings and spiritual protection if, if they don't follow the apostles and prophets. So with all of that said, one of the complexities in talking about NAR is that many people, as you said, deny NAR even exists. So you identified one of those churches and you said, hey, this is one of the well-known leaders out there who is part of this movement. But if you go to their website, they explicitly deny being part of it. So that's on one level um, a challenge in talking about this. On another level, some people say NAR doesn't exist at all. You know, forget about saying, hey, I'm not part of NAR. It's out there, but I'm not part of it. But hey, this doesn't even exist. This is just something in the minds of certain people like Holly Pivik, for example. Why, why do people deny it exists in the first place? And why would someone like Mike Bickle say, hey, no, I'm not part of it? Even though you're saying that when you look at what's actually going on there, from your perspective, it's very clear that they are under the influence of these teachings. Right, so people don't like to be labeled as being associated with a controversial movement that is seen as outside the mainstream of, of evangelicalism or of Christianity. They don't want to be part of a movement that's been associated with extreme teachings and practices. So, so they resist the label altogether. And really, this isn't a surprise. I mean, people that have promoted prosperity gospel teachings over the decades have resisted that label. Um, you know, there's all kinds of um, people who are, are part of movements that might resist, might resist that particular label. Um, but the, the key issue is, do they hold to the core teachings that there are apostles and prophets today and, and that they govern the church, that they're authoritative apostles and prophets and they're bringing new revelation? And, and one thing I want to point out is many of these, these same people who have denied they're part of the New Apostolic Reformation or have tried to distance themselves from it have actually used the label New Apostolic Reformation of themselves. Uh, so, for instance, there's the International Coalition of Apostolic Leaders, one of the largest international coalitions. Up until January of this year, 2022, they were using the term New Apostolic Reformation on their website, tying it to C. Peter Wagner, who many leaders have been trying to distance themselves from. Uh, so they were defining it like C. Peter Wagner would, this controversial apostle. They And they, they have a picture of the 12 apostles on their website, with Jesus next to using this term, New Apostolic Reformation, and that was up there until January. Now it's been removed. 
and the the picture of the twelve apostles and Jesus is still there, but not the the term New Apostolic Reformation or the the references to C. Peter Wagner, I think, have been removed. And this has been happening. Other organizations have, and leaders have been doing this. They've been removing references uh, from their websites, um, you know, even though they, they use this label of themselves. And so there's really damage control that's been going on. Um, and even this week, interestingly, on, on uh, let's see, on, um, it was yesterday, a statement came out called, uh, the, on uh, the New Apostolic Reformation or NAR and Christian Nationalism. It was put out by Michael Brown and Joseph Matera, who's, who's been a longtime leader in the NAR movement. And it's a statement that they're, they've gotten some other NAR leaders to sign. And they're basically, the purpose of the statement is to distance themselves from NAR and to, and to people who sign this statement can say they reject that they're part of NAR or that they hold to the extreme NAR teachings. Uh, but the problem is that many of the, the people who've signed this document, and even Joseph Matera himself, who's one of the producers of this document, have promoted the Coronar teachings and still do through the years. And so this is an example of you're, you're starting to see more and more of these statements coming out and, and things, but people have to be very careful when they see a statement like that and they say, oh, look, so-and-so signed this statement. They're not part of NAR. That doesn't necessarily mean that's true. The, the key issue is are they promoting authoritative present-day apostles and prophets. And for the the average person who is new to all of this and is listening and is thinking, well, if somebody's not going to come right out and label themselves or their church as part of NAR, but I'm concerned that I don't want to be influenced by unbiblical teachings, and we will get into what those are, but just since you're bringing up this, this question about how we know, what would you say about what to look for? What are some of those key words? You're talking about authority and they're sitting under authority, but what would they, what are some of the things they might actually say that sound like a soft version of this, but that you and your experience can look at and say, oh, this is definitely a NAR kind of church, or these are definitely NAR teacher teachings. What are the buzzwords to look for that would suggest that this is the case? Right. What I'd say to look for is terms like fivefold ministry. And I want to be careful here because sometimes Pentecostals and Charismatics will use some of these terms. Um, like, but um, fivefold ministry is generally a clue if you hear that term that uh, because they believe that there's five offices that are supposed to govern the church, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. They base that on Ephesians 4.11. So fivefold ministry, this new statement that just came out, NAR and Christian nationalism, they use the term Ephesians 4.11 ministry. Um, so that's a euphemism. Um, if you hear references to the offices of apostle and prophet, that's a big sign that a church is NAR. But one really well-known uh, NAR leader actually told me that they're starting to move away from using the term offices because they know it's controversial. So now they're using the term functions or, or grace gifts when they refer to apostles and prophets. So these are all terms to look out for. Um, ascension gifts, uh, they talk about um, all different ways of referring to specifically the apostles and prophets, uh, uh, apostolic, prophetic, if you hear those a adjectives, if you hear people talking about being in alignment, aligning with apostles and prophets, or, or coming under their spiritual covering, cover, uh, the covering of the apostles and prophets, those are all terms to look out, look out for too. And again, the use of a single word might not necessarily mean somebody is NAR, but it's definitely a clue to dig deeper and um, if you start hearing a lot of this terminology used together, you know, that's definitely a big sign. Yeah, that, that's very helpful, I think, because today labels, you know, the, even the label Christian, we know, <laughs> often doesn't mean what we think it means. So we can't just simply look out for somebody waving a giant flag saying, I'm part of the NAR movement. We have to actually understand the teachings and, and not just that, oh, they, they fall under this label, but what are the problems that come along with that? So with that, I want to transition to actually talking about your book, because in the book, you say that your focus is really on showing these concrete ways that NAR theology is showing up in churches, ministries, and music. And I think you did an amazing job of that, because a lot of times when I've seen people try to defend the NAR teachings, they're often minimizing the theological differences versus churches who would hold to the historic Christian faith. But when you give so many concrete, tangible examples in the book, and the book is loaded with them to show that these are unquestionably 
unbiblical things that are showing up in NAR churches and in the NAR movement, it's much harder for people to deny that this is a problem. So on one level, yes, we want to understand what NAR means, what it is as a movement, kind of what broadly characterizes the movement. But on another level, sometimes we just have to understand, well, what are the actual manifestations of it to look for that maybe have nothing to do with the NAR label, but that you're seeing pop up in your church? So I want to go through several of those kinds of examples to give people that tangible understanding. And to be clear for anyone listening, this is just a small handful. I wouldn't want anyone to hear this interview and think, oh, Holly's just picking out a couple of weird things. And that can happen in any church. That can happen in a you know, a very conservative evangelical church also. There are weird things everywhere. This is just to highlight a couple of examples. But Holly's book just goes through example after example after example. And so you really need to get to the book and understand all the ways that this will manifest itself. And I personally have friends who have seen in their conservative mainline denominational church this pop up where the church is promoting certain practices and that's not you know coming out of a nar place that's within the church and the church didn't even realize that this was the case and so this is going on everywhere so let's start in terms of those examples with the bethel school of supernatural ministry which you talk about in a chapter called hogwarts for christians which is a reference to harry potter and while that chapter was is very eye-opening. You know, I was loosely familiar with it, but to see the examples you give, they're literally trying to teach people to develop supernatural powers. Tell people listening what this school is and kind of introduce us to what are its stated purposes, what kind of program are they offering to people, and why is this concerning to you from a biblical perspective? Right, so it's a full-time three-year program where students enroll to learn to become miracle workers and they offer, you could go on campus, or now they're actually offering these classes online. And I want to emphasize that many other churches have started their own supernatural schools of ministry, uh, utilizing BSSM curriculum or, or their own curriculum. So there's literally um, hundreds, maybe thousands of these uh, throughout the world, throughout the nation and throughout the world. And, and BSSM has their own school planning division to help churches plant, plant these schools. Um, and, and But at BSSM, uh, more than 13,000 students have graduated since the school started. So they have a lot of students. It was started in 1998 by Chris Valatin. And um, the students themselves have fondly referred to their school as Hogwarts for Christians. That's a label they've given their own school um, based, of course, on the School of Witchcraft and wiz Wizardry and the Harry Potter book series. Um, and so the students learn to work miracles or you, they get, engage in these prophetic activation exercises and things that that maybe we'll talk about a little later, I think. But they learn to work miracles like prophesying, and then they've gone to like psychic fairs where they pose as psychics, and they give what they call spirit readings. Uh, that's their term. Um, or sometimes they'll say prophetic readings um, to people. And they call it a creative form of evangelism, but they avoid using Christian terminology like Jesus or God or the Holy Spirit. And so God may become the spirit of creation or, or something like that, that, that is what they'll refer to God as. And because they don't want the New Agers to necessarily detect that they're Christians. And um, so the question becomes, how can they truly be engaged in evangelism when they're avoiding using the name of Jesus? And, um, and, and they'll say, you know, sometimes they, they'll say, well, somebody gave their life to Jesus uh, when they came to their, their tent or, and got a spirit reading. But it's never really clear what they mean by gave their life to Jesus. Uh, you know, was the gospel really presented, the true gospel presented? And so over the years, many students also teamed up with an organization called Christ Alignment. And if people go to their website, they'll see this is uh, a very uh, new age type looking organization that's supposed to be a Christian organization. And what Christ Alignment does is they give destiny, destiny card readings. They've developed cards that look like tarot cards um, and they have pictures of animals and nature scenes and things like that on them. And they, they give readings of the cards to people who, who come up to them at psychic fairs. And, and they've answered questions like, have I chosen the right career for me? Will I have more children? They use these cards to answer questions and gain information for people, like tarot cards. And when it came to light that many, when many Bethel students were actually working with this organization, Christ Alignment, Bethel issued a statement that's uh, still on their website where... Uh, 
they defended uh, Christ Alignment um, and and their outreach, and but they denied that Christ Alignment was using these Destiny cards like tarot cards. But the problem is Christ Alignment themselves directly likened their cards to tarot cards on their website uh, until the critics drew attention to it, as, as such as myself. I wrote a blog post where I linked to their website and showed, look, they themselves are comparing these cards to tarot cards, even though they deny they're being used like tarot cards. And uh, that disappeared from the website after attention was drawn to it. But I still have screen captures <laughs> over at my blog where people can see that. And so um, it's just... There's really just a history of um, of people in this movement, of people at Bethel doing things like this, and then when they're caught or they're called out on it, or when people point it out, um, then the denials come in and, and things disappear from websites and things like that. So it's really concerning. You know, when I when I hear you talk about all this, it's it's really hard as a Christian to hear that there is a Christian church, a church that calls themselves Christian, at least, that runs this this school of supernatural ministry that sounds like something out of the occult, that it's, you know, all, pa these pagan practices. And it just, it kind of begs the question, well, who who's in charge of this school? And I, you know, I know you don't know everyone's motivations, but I'm just curious what your view is, because it's Im almost impossible to imagine that whoever is running this is a Christian who has any knowledge of the Bible. Are they proactively trying to lead people astray? Is it an effort to get Christians into another kind of movement? It, or are they really that blinded to the truth that they think that these kinds of things like tarot cards are consistent with Christianity? I, again, I know I'm not, I'm not really asking you to look at their hearts, but do you have any, I, I guess, do you have any insight into that question? Because it just seems so foreign to anything that someone who's actually a Christian would promote. Yeah, well, um, you know, we, we try, we do try to avoid guessing people's motives, you know, when we, we critique the leaders of this movement. I do think scripture talks about that, that when there are deceivers in the church, they can be deceiving people and simultaneously they themselves can be deceived. And so it can be a both and, you know, they're deceiving, but they're also deceived themselves. And um, it's um, it, it's truly scary. I mean, the type of practices that they are uh, drawing Christians into um, these occult, these occult like practices that we talk about in our book. And I think we're going to talk about a little bit more later, um, because the danger is that um, it's opening people up to deception and it's opening people up to the demonic influence, which, which is actually really scary. So former new agers like Doreen Virtue have talked about, uh, th they're very concerned about these type of practices, uh, coming out of like Bethel church, because they would say, you know, there's people that have come out of the new age and then they're getting drawn back in to these occultic practices in the name of Christianity, which is pretty disturbing. In case anyone's unfamiliar with what we mean by new age when we're talking about that, let's let's dig into that a little bit more because you explicitly point out in the book that there's a lot of overlap between new age practices and you've described some of them just with respect to the Bethel School of Supernatural Ministry. But this goes beyond just Bethel Church. This is something that you've noted happens throughout NAR churches more broadly. So can you just explain what the new age is briefly for people who aren't familiar with that? But how have you seen that manifest itself through other churches, not just in this school of ministry. Yeah, well, New Age is, is basically it's kind of, it's a popularization of like Eastern type religious practices that have, uh, uh, you know, have been popularized and kind of um, combined with um, a popular thinking in American culture. And and so th there are cultic practices, though, New Age practices. And so um, and the thing that's really interesting is is Bethel leaders and other NAR leaders will, will directly state that they believe that the practices they're promoting are very similar to New Age practices. And there's a book called The Physics of Heaven that Bill Johnson and his wife, uh, Benny, contributed to, that Chris Belton contributed to, and many other NAR leaders. And in this book, the claim is made that New Agers actually stole these practices from Christians. And that the original early church, the first century Christians, pra had these practices. They were lost. And now they're restoring these practices to the church. And that New Agers claim, 
you know, stole them, but now we need to re redeem them and reclaim, the, reclaim them for the church in order to have the tools we need to bring God's kingdom to earth. So they actually aren't shy about saying that their practices look like, um, like New Age practices. They're actually very open about that. And What's so one of, what, just, to, just to give people quickly back. an example then from that book in particular where they're saying, you know, hey, we're just taking something back from what New Agers took mm -hmm. from us. What's one example? I think you mentioned spirit travel. Is that is that one yeah, of the ones that you're spirit travel is one thing they talk about where Explain what that is. <laughs> people's physical body supposedly remains in one location, but their spirit travels to other places in the world where they can maybe overhear conversations being spoken by like, like uh, rulers or leader presidents of other nations or or even to different times like your your spirit could travel to the past or the future um this is something that's that's promoted in their books um we're talking about things like telepathy there was a pastor at, at bethel church who was a, a past a children's pastor and he was teaching the parents to communicate with their children spiritually or more popularly known as mind reading uh with the children and he was talking about how one time when he did that with his own son, when his son was sleeping and he was sick and he couldn't communicate with his dad, he was sending messages, you know, uh, like mind reading with his son. Um, necromancy. I mean, this is a, a practice that is promoted by many leaders in the movement of communicating with deceased believers. Um, so necromancy is communicating with the dead. It's, it's one of the occultic practices forbidden in scripture. And um, you have very influential prophets such as Sean Bolt who on the stage at Bethel Church claimed during a leadership conference to receive communication from a deceased prophet named Bob Jones, who was delivering messages for Bill Johnson, who was sitting in the audience. And Sean Boltz has taught that believers should expect more and more types of communication from their deceased relatives uh, in the days ahead, that this type of communication is going to increase. That's actually quite, uh, quite a common teaching in this movement. Um, and then activating people with prophetic gifts. That's something I witnessed firsthand when I went to, to Bethel Church and attended their um, Firestarters Adult Sunday School class, um, where, they, where they, they teach that everybody has these miraculous gifts, that we all have these miraculous gifts, like prophesying and things like that, that just need to be activated within, within us. And so, but the way they teach to activate miraculous gifts in people has a lot more similarities with the way New Agers would try to awaken supernatural powers in themselves, like psychic powers. And, and that's that was such an interesting part of the book to me, too, that you went to the class. So in one sense, you're an investigative reporter when you're going out and you're looking for information on what people have written, the books that they've endorsed, those kinds of things. But you've also gone and seen this firsthand. So anyone who might be thinking, well, maybe other people are you know, misrepresenting it, whatever the case may be. You've seen this firsthand. You've been in the class. Talk a little bit about what you observed when you were there. How long did you go for and, and what did you hear yourself? Yeah, so I visited the main adult Sunday school class. It's called Firestarters. And just so people know, that's a NAR buzzword. Firestarters is a reference to a NAR, to people who start revival, uh, NAR revivals. Um, and so I, I went to one class, and that particular class, it, it was something like a six- or an eight-week class, but that particular class, they were activating people in prophetic gifts. That was the purpose of that class. In other classes, they were activating them learning how to heal people and work miracles of healing and that kind of thing. This class, they were teaching people to prophesy. And so the interesting thing, you know, at the beginning of class, when I first walked in, um, um, and even at the very beginning, one of the first things the instructor said in the class was, uh, you know, there's only one rule in this class. I want you to get drunk, and I want you to get other people drunk. And by drunk, he meant drunk on the Holy Spirit. And so throughout the class, he would instruct people to pretend they were holding like this imaginary like bottle of wine and to drink out of it. And when people did that, they would start laughing uncontrollably and some would fall to the ground and stagger. This one woman was like passed out the entire class like she was drunk. So this drunkenness in the spirit was kind of going on throughout the whole class. Um, and whenever he felt like people, I don't know, needed another drink, he would, <laughs> he would encourage them to drink more, you know, throughout the class. But then, then the, the main purpose of the class that day was to teach people to prophesy. And the way, the way that that was done was four volunteers were called to the front of the room. These were people who had never prophesied before and wanted to learn. And they were basically told to come to the front of the room one at a time 
and to just say whatever pops into their head as a prophetic word for someone in the in the classroom. There were probably about sixty or seventy people in this classroom, and um, and so they would do that. So someone would would say, you know, I feel like I'm getting the, a certain name, and you know, the name might be like Anthony, and I'm getting a certain birth date, and does that match anybody in this room? You know, and then somebody might raise their hand if they had that birthday, but they say, oh, that's not my name, but that's my birthday. And, and the person would say, you know, well, that's close enough. And then they would give a prophetic word to this person. And it, it could be whatever popped into their head. Um, as long as it was a positive, encouraging word, they were told only to give positive, encouraging words. They were told not to worry um, if they got the, uh, the prophesied wrong. It didn't matter, they said. If you're wrong, who cares? You're learning how to prophesy and you'll make mistakes. And, of course, that's concerning because there's many warnings in Scripture about false prophets, the need to test all prophecies. Um, the Apostle John told us not to believe every spirit, but to test the spirits because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Jesus himself said, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. And there's just many more warnings in Scripture about false prophets, false apostles, and testing all things and all prophecies. And so... Um, uh, we talk about how activating people in a prophetic gift like they do at Bethel has more in common with New Age occult practices that are designed to awaken latent psychic powers in people. And, you know, as Christians, many Christians um, do believe that the miraculous gifts are still for today, gifts like healing and working miracles, and that's debated. Some people would say they're not. But even those who believe the miraculous gifts are still available today, um, they believe that those are gifts given by the Holy Spirit to people as he alone decides. It's, they're not gifts that can be activated in every person who just wants them. And it's definitely not done through taking part in these classroom-type exercises. And, and the Bible also has strong warnings about taking part in occultic practices. Um, you know, in Deuteronomy 18, 9 through 12, that's forbidden um, explicitly, practicing divination, fortune-telling, reading omens, all these type of things. But um, so when we talk about these type of uh, like new age type practices that are being promoted by Bethel, these are practices that are that uh, really resemble divination and, um, and, and psychic powers and things like that. And these are explicitly forbidden in scripture. I'm glad that you brought up this whole issue of how do we test the prophets? What does the Bible say about that? Because prophets should be testable. <laughs> that, that's kind of a, a core teaching within Scripture. We don't see prophets in Scripture who are prophesying and then it fails and they say, oh, I guess I just got that one wrong. That That's just not a pattern that you see in, in Scripture. That's not an instance that you see in Scripture. But you talk a lot about in the book the fact that these prophets, these NAR prophets, have made repeated prophecies that have been proven false, that you can see the prophecy, you can see what they are saying is going to happen, and then you can see that it didn't actually take place. So give us some examples of those, because to me, that is such a clear indication that we are talking about people who are not truly prophets. Uh, you know, you can look at the Bible, you can see the test, you can see what they're doing today, and to me, that's proof. A lot of people, though, can justify that and kind of sweep it away. So give us some examples of that and then kind of give us your thoughts on why is that not compelling in and of itself to people that, hey, this is not a prophet because they prophesied something that wasn't fulfilled. Right. So a prophet is someone who speaks messages for God with God's authority and any predictions they make must come to pass if they're a genuine prophet. Um, that's made clear in Deuteronomy 18, 20 through 22. In the Old Testament, if a prophet spoke falsely, um, even once was enough, they were to be put to death. And, and of course, um, you know, in the New Testament, there's not a, um, there's not a, a penalty prescribed like there was in the Old Testament for getting it wrong. But, but prophecy is still, um, there's nothing between the Old Testament and the New Testament that changes the standard. The penalty may be different, but the standard isn't of, of 100% accuracy. And, but NAR prophets say that this test doesn't apply to them anymore, that this test only applied to the Old Testament prophets. So genuine prophets can make mistakes when they prophesy and still be considered genuine prophets. And so many, uh, dozens of prophets uh, prophesied that um, Trump would win a second consecutive term in office as president in the 2020 election. Dozens, including uh, Chris Vallotton was one. 
and um, and they're still viewed as as genuine prophets, even though they they messed up there and even admitted uh, that they made a mistake. Um, other prophets, numerous prophets, prophesied that COVID would come to an end very quickly, very early on when COVID first started. They said this isn't going to become the pandemic that everyone fears. It's not going to be this big thing everyone's afraid of. It's going to end quickly, and that didn't happen. And um, and so, but again, because they teach that you can be a prophet and make mistakes, uh, that these people can go on continuing to to be regarded as prophets. Well, what is their justification for claiming that? If the well, Bible, if the um, Bible is very clear that this will disqualify you from being a prophet, and then you come along and you say, "Well, I got this wrong," but you don't have to get everything right to be a genuine prophet. Do they actually offer some kind of explanation, justification for believing that? Is it just that they've gotten new revelation that tells them that, which is, you know, a circular argument? Well, so um, Wayne Grudem has actually. A, a, a very respected, uh, you know, evangelical theologian has popularized the idea that New Testament prophecy can err, and he's talking about the gift of prophecy. So actually, um, um, many Pentecostals, Charismatics believe that that if you have the gift of prophecy, you can have that gift and make mistakes. The difference, though, is he wasn't talking about the NAR office of prophet, where these people also claim to have extraordinary authority. And so, so even if you do believe that you could have a gift of prophecy and make mistakes when you prophesy, um, which, you know, I, I actually uh, don't agree with that. But even if you do agree with that, it's a different thing to say that you can have the office of prophets, this authoritative office that's really on par with the great Old Testament prophets and still make mistakes while prophesying. So they want to have the type of authority and functions that the Old Testament prophets did, but not be held to the same level of accountability. Got it. Okay, very interesting distinction there. So it comes down to the authority that they're claiming while making mistakes. So you're sitting under their authority, but they might be wrong. That's kind of what it right. comes down to. So how, how, do you, how do you ever know if you can believe them or act on anything right. they say? We could be mistaken. What is even the point, you know, of following someone like that? I, I want to touch on, we, we, we've talked about the kind of the connection with these new age types of practices. But there's another crossover that you talk about in the book that I've seen a lot as well, which is with the so-called prosperity gospel. So for those unfamiliar, can you explain what the prosperity gospel is when we use that term? And how does that relate to the teachings of NAR? How is it different and how is it very similar? Right. So the prosperity gospel basically is, is the teaching that God wants all believers to be healthy, to be wealthy, to be prosperous. Um, and so NAR embraces the prosperity gospel. What they teach is they, they teach that the prosperity gospel is one of the lost truths that apostles and prophets have been restoring to the church through the centuries. Um, um, just like they've restored other truths, like apostles and prophets are supposed to govern churches or, you know, all these other truths they, they've allegedly restored. The prosperity gospel is one of those truths they restored. Um, and, but they put a spin on the prosperity gospel. The NAR spin is that the purpose of the wealth is so believers can build God's kingdom on earth. And they, there's many NAR prophets, there are many NAR prophets have prophesied what's called the great end time transfer of wealth prophecy, which is that in the last days God will transfer the wealth of the wicked to the righteous. And the purpose of that is so that the righteous will have the money they need to build God's physical kingdom on earth. And so they kind of say, like, we believe the prosperity gospel, but it's it's oh, it's a holy prosperity gospel because we're using the wealth to build God's kingdom. But but so it kind of sanctifies it. But it, it doesn't really because they also do teach that that, you know, you personally as a believer will reap the benefits of, of that health and that wealth and, and that prosperity. Um you know, that when the wealth is transferred from the wicked to the righteous, it's going to come to you. Um, so so they've embraced the prosperity gospel, but put this NAR spin on it. So is it fair to say then that most of the NAR movement, if not all the NAR movement, would incorporate some version of the prosperity gospel, but churches that teach the prosperity gospel and kind of are oriented in that way are not necessarily NAR churches. So it kind of goes one way, but not necessarily the other. Is that a fair summary? 
Yeah, I would say that's fair. I would say many prosperity gospel churches probably have been influenced by NAR, but I would I would say yes. If you're NAR, you definitely would embrace the prosperity gospel, but the, the prosperity gospel was around before NAR really was popularized. So right, yeah, they've kind of incorporated it and, like you said, put their own spin on things. So right. that's that that's a that's a helpful distinction there. Also, this is this is so great, Holly. I appreciate all of your distinctions on these things. So let's talk about the elephant in the room: NAR or Bethel specific music. Music is probably the most common way that Bethel, especially, has influenced in so many churches, and it's also probably the way that most average Christians sitting in the church, if they've heard of any of this, that's how they've heard about it. They know that Bethel produces music. So you speak to three particular dangers of allowing this music in your local church. So we're talking about churches that are not in our churches. You go to a biblically sound church. You go there every Sunday. You love your church, but they're singing Bethel songs. What are the three dangers you identify in your book? Why is this a problem? Yeah, so we talk about in the book that music is the catechism of today's church and that belie- beliefs are really woven into the hearts through music. You can you can walk out of church and, and sadly forget maybe what the pastor preached on pretty quickly, but you'll the songs might stay in your head. You know, like you said, reckless Christianity is going to be in your head all day now just because I mentioned it. You know, they stay in your head. And so music is powerful and uh, it forms our beliefs. And um, the three dangers are first... Uh, Their music, uh, Bethel music, uh, NAR music, smuggles in NAR theology. And people may not realize that until they learn the lingo and the buzzwords and really are really cued in on what the teachings of the movement are. But when you are, you can see that their songs reference things like prayer declarations, which is a NAR practice. It's the idea that our, our spoken words can create reality. So they're not talking about praying, like asking God, if it's your will, will you please do this or that? They're saying we can declare that God will heal or he will do this miracle. That's woven into the music. The dominionism, the idea of bringing God's kingdom to earth is woven in the music. Um, A lot of heavy emphasis on miracles, even like modern day resurrections from the dead, can be found in the lyrics of the songs. And it's a, it's not just that they reference miracles, but it's that they are referencing them so constantly. They make it sound like miracles are normative and they're happening all the time and that miracles are a sign of God's love for people. And so it's, it's falsely, it's, um, it's, it's teaching people that to expect miracles to be normative and a sign of God's love for them. So these are all different ways. Um, and we go really more into the lyrics in our book and give specific examples of Bethel songs and other NAR songs and how the lyrics smuggle in the theology. That's the first one. The second one is uh, NAR music draws people to NAR. And many people will talk about how it was Bethel music that they first started listening to the music and loved it. And that got them interested in Bethel Church. They started attending conferences and ruling in Bethel School of Supernatural Ministry. So it really is a hook to draw people into Bethel. And then, um, and even the leaders of Bethel themselves, like Bill Johnson, for example, has stated uh, that he sees the music, Bethel music, as a means of planting the the Bethel teachings and practices in churches around the world. They've explicitly stated that. And then the third danger is NAR music divorces the heart from the head. Uh, The emphasis on how it makes people feel, how they feel close to God when they sing the songs and And the emphasis is not on the content. And this is dangerous because all kinds of half-baked ideas and and faulty notions um, can sneak by and lodge themselves in our mind when we're not thinking critically about lyrics, but just focusing on how the music makes us feel. I think that that's helpful for people to understand about how these things are coming in. And especially that you can, if you don't know the lingo of some of these things, you don't even realize what you're singing. You know, you might think that you're singing about the resurrection and you're thinking the resurrection of Jesus, but it might be talking about real life resurrections that they claim to have experienced and that they have claimed to have done. But yet you don't realize it unless you actually know the lingo you know the music um so when i put the subject of bethel and nar out to readers on social media the most popular question was this what are your thoughts on how to respond to individuals or church leadership who fully agree that nar is dangerous so they would listen to this and say yes i agree this is a really big problem we need to stand against their teachings and it's seeping into the church 
But yet these leaders or individuals still feel like it's okay to use Bethel songs as long as those individual songs are theologically fine. What, what would you say about that? That's the most popular question. When somebody posted that one, I asked for people, what do you want Holly to answer? Everyone voted this one up. So what do you say to that? Yeah, I'm not surprised. That's one of the most popular questions we receive. I would say that a stated agenda and a stated agenda lies behind the music. To, Bill Johnson has said a purpose of Bethel Music is to spread their teachings and practices throughout the world. And um, as I said, many people said they were first drawn to Bethel initially by the music. So when churches that are otherwise sound use NAR music, the leaders are giving an applied pass uh, that to those churches that produce that music. Whether intentionally or intentionally or not, they are communicating that Bethel or Jesus Culture or the International House of Prayer are okay churches or that they're even good or admirable churches when they use their music. Uh, the song selection legitimatizes those churches in the eyes of the people. You know, when they see our church is using Bethel music songs or using, you know, Jesus culture songs or these other songs, then they must, they think, well, really, these churches can't be that bad. They might even, you know, be good. And it becomes more, also becomes more difficult to warn people about the dangers of Bethel and about NAR when so many churches use their music. I can just say it makes our job a lot harder. Um, to warn people about NAR uh, when every church down the street is using their music. And um, and so pastors need to be aware that um, people in their church, they're putting people at their church in risk of getting caught up in spiritual bondage to these apostles and prophets. And it's really a, it's a matter of practical wisdom and discernment, we would say. We, we don't say it's a sin to use the music, but we advise against it because... They shouldn't use anything in a worship service that will prime people to be more receptive to NAR teachings or that will serve to help advance the NAR agenda. And I can see sometimes people would say something like, well, if you're going to go back to the beliefs of every songwriter who's ever written a song, you're going to find some unorthodox beliefs or you're going to find something about how they live their life that's not consistent with the Bible because we're all humans. So I can see why some people would say, well, how is that different than with Bethel where we're looking and we're saying, hey, we don't, we don't agree with all of their theology, but we can sing this particular song. But I think what I'm hearing you say is that that's not necessarily a comparison we should make because of the widespread influence of Bethel in particular, and that it is it is a consistent problem. It is having an impact on so many people, and it is an entryway into not just some somewhat different uh, beliefs, but some very, very problematic beliefs that like the occult so that we're talking about. This is this is a very extreme example. It's not like just digging up every single person who's ever written a song. This is a movement today. This is something impacting millions of people. And so when we give it that implied endorsement of going ahead and putting their name in front of people in our churches, even if the song itself might be fine, then we're just adding to the perception that Bethel in general is okay. Okay. And because of the name, because of the influence, that's especially problematic versus digging into any individual behind a song. Is that, is that a fair summary of kind of why well, those well things said. are different? Well said. And we're not asking the, the, song, the songwriters to have perfect theology. What we're talking about is, is aberrant theology. It's seriously dangerous error. And it is a current movement that many people are, are, it's shipwrecking the faith of many people. It's causing disillusionment and, and people are, are leaving the faith and, and um, spiritual abuse that's happening in these churches. And there's so much harm from this, this movement. And, you know, sometimes I'll hear people say, well, this hymn writer back from hundreds of years ago was part of the sketchy movement and we sing his song. Well, nobody's being drawn into that sketchy movement from hundreds of years ago. It's not a threat or a risk today. <laughs> you know, the risk today is NAR and, and, and this music. And, and we're talking about serious error and harm that is being caused and promoted by this movement. And or har serious harm that's being caused and the serious error that's being promoted. And so it's, we're not doing nitpicking, you know, at minor right. theological differences or, or just secondary non-important issues or something like that.
Right. There's so much in your book, Holly, that I wish we had the time to talk about, um, including the Passion Translation, uh, which is a whole Bible translation by NAR leader, uh, talking about their end times views, their eschatology. You talked a little bit about dominionism and what that means in terms of bringing God's kingdom to earth. So many important subjects. You, you guys who are listening, you're just going to have to get the book to read about those subjects because they're, they're important and they show up in all kinds of conversations related to this. So if you're thinking, oh, I really wish you'd talk about this, I encourage you to get the book. But I did want to pull a few questions from listeners um, that don't necessarily get talked about as often and leave some time for that here. So aside from the most popular one, which I already gave you, here are a few others. Uh, The first one, how should you bring up the problems with Bethel with friends who are actively encouraging others to follow them? So let's say you know somebody and they're pulling people along. They themselves are engaged in it. They're telling other people about it. How do you even broach that topic? Right. So First, I would probably ask if they're aware of the concerns about Bethel and the the New Apostolic Reformation. Just ask the question. um, See if they're willing to learn more. If if they're not aware of the concerns, um, you know, are they willing to read books? Are they willing to watch some videos or listen to some podcasts and just get educated about the New Apostolic Reformation and the dangers of Bethel teachings? Um, I also would say they could ask questions, Greg Kokel tactic style. Um, you know, um, it's really a good tool to ask people questions. So if somebody is is promoting Bethel Church actively, you could say, you know, well, what is it that you find so attractive uh, about Bethel Church? And um, do you believe that Bill Johnson is an apostle? Um, how do you know he's an apostle? Is What evidence do you have for that? Is that evidence sufficient? Uh, what does the Bible say about apostles? The, does he meet that criteria? Um, you know, ask about different practices, like are prayer declarations biblical, you know, that Bethel promotes? Um, where in Scripture do you find support for that practice? Um, if they point to a verse, which they probably will, out of context, that, you know, are there other understandings of that passage? Have you read any commentaries where people talk about that passage to see maybe how other people have interpreted that passage? And so just ask a lot of questions. And then I would say really you need to probably pray for their eyes to be opened. Because if somebody is actively promoting Bethel or or other NAR churches and teachings, then they've probably already uh, been hooked to quite a degree. And um, they may be resistant. Honestly, many people will will be resistant who are part of this movement because, because the leaders of this movement inoculate their followers against criticism. And they warn them that there are critics out there, like myself, um, and, and they'll even say that the critics are motivated by demonic spirits and things like that, and, and not to listen to the critics and not to read their books and things like that. And so if they've been inoculated against criticism, then they may be very resistant or not really listen uh, to your concerns. So you really need to pray for God to open their eyes. A second question is from somebody who says, I'm particularly concerned recently about their Sozo ministry. Am I saying that right? Sozo? Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yes, that's right. She, she says, I'm particularly concerned recently about their Sozo ministry, Sozo ministry school, and the worldwide spreading of this very questionable practice. There be, appear to be more and more stories coming out from people who have suffered terrible things due to their or a family member's Sozo experience. Holly, what is Sozo and why is it concerning? Right, so Sozo is is described by Bethel as an inner, inner healing and deliverance ministry, and by deliverance they mean like demonic deliverance. Um, it's been popularized by Bethel Church, and really it's about helping people find emotional and spiritual healing, so as opposed to physical healing, like they really emphasize the physical miracles. Well, this is for emotional and spiritual healing from things like anxiety, depression, maybe suicidal thoughts, um, traumatic memories, this kind of thing. And so what people will do is they'll book Sozo sessions um, that are led by trained Sozo ministers. There could be one to three ministers, and these sessions can last a few hours. And the minister will pray and ask the Holy Spirit to prophetically reveal reveal the source of the person's uh, struggles. And um, so, But many people claim that they have experienced false recovered memories during these sessions. Um, so people will say that it was suggested to them during these sessions things like that their parents had abused them with their, when they were children and they had forgotten that and didn't remember it until the session. 
and we talked about this in our book, but, um, you know, these, these type of false recovered memories have resulted in children cutting off their parents completely and suddenly, and their parents are just heartbroken because their children won't communicate with them anymore. And, uh, you know, and actually we've heard tons of stories about, about kids that, uh, went off to Bethel and whether they took part in Sozo or not, um, uh, would suddenly cut off their parents, their family, break out contact with them, wouldn't even invite their own um, rel family members to their own wedding or graduation or that kind of thing. Um, so, but with Sozo in particular, these false recovered memories have caused a lot of, of, lot of heart heartache. And they deny, um, you know, if you go to Wikipedia, there's an article about uh, inner healing ministry or something like that where they talk about Sozo. And, and there's a claim on there that the, the people that lead Sozo deny that they're taking part in this recovered memory therapy. But um, we've looked at it closely and, and um, it, you know, us along with many others have really determined that this really does seem to be a, a form of recovered memory therapy. And, and many people have reported being damaged from it. Wow. So I don't want to go too far down, down the rabbit hole on this one, but I have to ask, what kind of training or is there a certain kind of training that these so-called counselors go through so that they're all learning the same method of, quote unquote, helping people? Or is this just a loose network of people who say, oh, yeah, I'm going to do the Sozo method? I mean, how, how top down is this in terms of the training and approach? Yeah, Bethel does provide training, and they actually, so Sozo Ministries have been planted at churches throughout the world, and you can go to their website and find out where all those ministries are and how many there are and that kind of thing, and they provide training, and one concern is that that they're, during these Sozo sessions, people are dealing with very complex issues, like it could be marital problems, it could be depression, anxiety, serious issues, and it, these people are not these ministers are not trained to deal with the complexity of the issues. And so somebody could go to one of these sessions and think they were cured. And, you know, because they think a demon was cast out of them or something like that when they weren't cured and they're left with the problems. And, and so there's been real concerns raised about how they're delving into real psychological issues without having the psychological training to do that and, and the damage that can do to people. And I and I've heard of what we were talking about earlier with just, you know, traditional biblical churches who are incorporating this kind of ministry into their church. And so that's, again, another way where you don't think your church has been NAR influenced, but you also didn't recognize that, oh, this sozo thing that they've been offering is actually straight out of the NAR movement. Uh, someone asks, what are your thoughts on Christian artists who do concerts with NAR artists? And I'll add a similar point to that. You know, what are your thoughts similarly about Christian pastors or speakers who leaders or leaders who share the stage with NAR leaders? Is this the same kind of thing as what you said earlier with the music where, hey, the implied endorsement, given the impact the NAR has today is really problematic? Or do you feel differently when it comes to talking about sharing a stage in some way? No, it would be similar. Um, so we advise against uh, uh, leaders, um, you know, partnering, uh, sharing a platform, whether it's music or a stage or, or even endorsing our leaders' books. It's unwise because they're lending their credibility to these artists and leaders. And I can tell you for a fact that those leaders do use that to defend themselves. They will say things like, well, so-and-so can't be that bad because, you know, Francis Chan thinks uh, they're, they're not bad or, you know, you know, and so, um, so people need to realize that Bethel teachings are a serious threat to the church. And instead of partnering with Bethel and other NAR organizations and using their theologically tainted resources and, and sharing stages with them, churches and ministers should partner with organizations and Christian leaders who promote biblically sound teaching. It's interesting that you bring up Francis Chan because when I was preparing for this, I was reading a whole statement yesterday that he has written because he has been criticized by people for sharing a stage at different conferences and events with people associated with NAR. And his response, and I'm just paraphrasing here, you can read the actual response online if anyone's interested, but basically his response is, you know, there are a lot of people who are sitting under unbiblical teaching, and if we only share the stage with people 
who we align with completely, who we agree with, who are biblically solid, then we're kind of putting ourselves in a position where we're never able to step outside of that box and speak to the people who need the biblically sound teaching. So in other words, if we're not willing to go in and speak at places where maybe people who have problematic beliefs are speaking, then maybe those people never hear biblically solid teaching. And I I think someone could fairly make that point to a degree. So I'm curious how you would respond to that. Well, I would say if somebody had only read that statement by Francis Chan, they could be persuaded by that. The thing people might not realize, though, that Francis Chan has gone way beyond just sharing stages with these speakers. That's how it started. It started with just accepting an invitation, I think, to speak at IHOP KC, you know, Mike Bickle's organization. But it's gotten to the point where he's he's been doing more and more with these leaders and actually apologizing to them, saying that he used to think they were false teachers and repenting of that and saying that he no longer feels that way and and um, you know just really I, I don't remember all his exact wording but really just gushing about these being brothers and and you know this and so it's gone beyond with him just sharing stages to actually fully throwing in his his support to these leaders and and apologizing to them for thinking they were ever false teachers and so he's really become a defender of the leaders in this movement and that's been sad to see because you know, I've um, I've really appreciated his ministry through the years. Right. Yeah. And, and I think that's that's important for people to understand that when you just take that statement, like I'm reading that statement yesterday, I'm thinking, well, that's you know, that's a fair point. But then when you go to the next step of saying, well, is it only sharing a stage or is it something more? You're saying, no, no, it's it's something more. So we always need to get that bigger context. So thank you for that. And finally, uh, someone asked, would you associate ministries like Hillsong and Elevation with NAR? Yeah, so what we say about Hillsong, if it's not overtly NAR, it definitely has a strong affinity for NAR beliefs. So leaders uh, like at Hillsong, within Hillsong, have referred to like, they refer to like Brian Houston as an apostle. People outside, really influential people outside Hillsong will refer to, have referred to Brian Houston as an apostle, and there's actually a book called The Apostolic Revolution that documents uh, the significant NAR influence on Hillsong. Um, and so um, NAR concepts and buzzwords can be found in Hillsong's music. Um, so so Hillsong, if it's not overtly NAR, um, if it's not, then it, it definitely is, is strongly influenced by NAR. And uh, Elevation songs, actually, NAR concepts and buzzwords can be found in, in Elevation songs as well. And that's not really a surprise to me because Elevation has collaborated with, uh, the Elevation artists collaborate with Bethel Music artists. Stephen Furtick uh, has spoken at Bethel Music conferences on stage with, like, Bill Johnson. And so so you can find um, things like references to um, making prayer declarations in, in elevation music and, and things like that, um, and also um, these concepts in Hillsong songs as well. So people need to be aware that that to watch all of the music and realize that even music that's not coming from a church that might not be overtly NAR, that, that church, the music can still have the concepts, the NAR concepts in the music. And a lot of times these artists are collaborating with each other and so, so um, the, the NAR concepts can come into the songs. Well, Holly, you are a wealth of knowledge on all of this, and I so much appreciate your time. I appreciate your willingness to step up and to say these things that need to be said and to do this research because I know that you receive a lot of pushback. And anytime somebody stands up in the church and says, hey, something is unbiblical, you are absolutely going to get a lot of pushback for that, even if you're right that it's unbiblical. So thank you for your boldness in proclaiming the truths about this movement, for warning people, for your time today really appreciate it thanks so much for being on the show thanks for your encouragement and support and just for um helping make your listeners aware about this movement i really appreciate it and if you're listening to this and it is before the release date of the book in november know that this is absolutely available right now for pre-order you can go and you can get it on amazon or other sites where you go to get books make sure to pre-order it you'll get it right away and it will be an eye-opening read for you i have no doubt as always if you're enjoying the show i ask that you take a minute to give it a rating and review on your favorite podcast player it helps more people learn about it and i appreciate it so much so thanks everyone for your time and we'll talk with you soon.